Reza is at uh, Toronto Metropolitan University. He, too, is the prize interested in uh, securing privacy of machine learning. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I guess this is ready. We'll use this because it doesn't crackle. Um, cool. So with only a little bit of further ado, uh, Reza. All right, everyone, can everyone hear me? No? Is it good? Okay, so I will be louder, hopefully. So, but yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. So I think uh, all of you have seen this image many times from a good flow, I think, uh, seminal work, and that if you have a, a impact, an image classification neural network with a just very unnoticeable uh, Perturbation, yeah. Hi, okay. Maybe this way it's better now? Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, fine. The, so yeah, the, uh, with a very, uh, in fact, small perturbation, you can uh, force the classifier to misclassify the image that you have, and in this case, in fact, uh, a panda to a given. So this is, uh, it's been in fact discussed a lot. So, and the uh, the, the the robustness property is that uh, a neural network we want to ensure that the model is able to handle this type of perturbation and distortion. So, still we want this guy to be classified as panda. And how it works is that uh, if I have, let's say, a neural network to classify the traffic signs for an autonomous vehicle and then uh, I will show a stop sign. I expect you know, a, a probability vector at the end of the softmax layer that in fact turns and tells me that, okay, this is a stop sign. But uh, as I said, maybe with just a, a very small uh, the attack sign or perturbation of that stop sign, which is not noticeable by, by human, in fact, this then may turn the, the, the sign to be classified as 40 kilometers per hour, which can be very safety, uh, um, an important safety concern, right? And uh, so we are dealing with, just very briefly, we are dealing with two classes now, two labels, one as the one that we want to target, and the other one is the runner-up that in fact quickly will be changed to that, uh, to that label if the perturbation is happened there. So, and uh, this is, uh, it is not very hard to generate this type of example. Uh, in fact, uh, Nicholas, in their 2016 paper, they showed that, in fact, that the effort you need to train a, a deep learning model to classify correctly is much, much higher than, is more than the finding an optimization problem to solve in order to find that virtual example. So we can easily, I mean, not easily, I mean, is, the, the effort is not that much and it's proportionate to the training of the model. And uh, there are the different techniques for this, LBFGS or uh, the FGSM, and there are many in fact, methods of generating those types of adversarial examples. And uh, this is not, uh, is not that you have to do lots of, adding lots of perturbation in order to get to that misclassification. In fact, the, the model collapses very quickly. So it is a two different types of attacks. Of course, the, 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 the uh, black one is than better, so in terms of from the attacker's perspective. And you, you can see that uh, when you have no perturbation, it's just almost 90% accurate, but with just 0 0.3 uh, attack size, you, the, the whole uh, in fact, performance collapses. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, in, in, in with this very little um, perturbation, you get a different uh, label for the class. Okay. What would be the defense for this type of uh, attacks or uh, adversarial uh, examples? So most of the uh, work that I will show you, the graph that I just looked at, the papers that have been published in the past five years, seven, eight, uh, seven, eight years, and in fact, most of them are working on training the model using those uh, adversarial examples. So you generate adversarial examples, you train your model iteratively, so your model will be uh, protected against those adversarial examples. What is the problem here? 
So the problem would be that the, attack, the your approach or your defense would be very much attack specific and only works for those seen examples and may fail against uh, more sophisticated attacks. And in fact, that goes to the, an arm race between the defender and an attacker. So uh, the need, there's a need for, for approaches that in fact look at the, 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 the methods that can protect uh, a machine learning model or a neural network against all types of attacks. I mean, all, not all possible in the world, but all based on generality of attack rather than a specific type of examples empirically generated. So, uh, so the question we asked, as I said, was the minimum accuracy under any attack, or given a prediction, can any attack change it? So these two questions we want to answer, and the so robustness in this sense, then the definition will be different, um, which is uh, in fact uh, formally as I put it here, but it just simply says that the we want to find the maximum perturbation that a DNN model can be distended and classify input correctly under some specific norm function. So some to find the size of that task. Okay. The, but the good news here is that this problem can be in fact formulated as an optimization problem. As I said, if you have two, two labels as Y0 and Y prime as the Y0 as the actual label and Y prime as the runner up uh, uh, label, then in fact, if we minimize the distance between the, or the margin of the probability between those two labels and uh, with the constraints that in fact, for all X within the, the epsilon uh, uh, distance, with, with some norm, in this case, uh, L2 norm, uh, if we minimize that, in fact, we can find the, the, we can certify the robot. How? Uh, we simply, we want to find this margin between these two functions based on the actual uh, label and the runner-up label, which you can see there between the, the, this margin. And if we minimize, and this, if this value, in fact, stays below zero, then we have a certified model. Why? Because we want to add as much as possible perturbation, but the, the amount should be such that doesn't allow the, uh, this term gets anything negative, right? So we have a still margin for Y prime to grow without sacrificing the misclassification, okay? So it's very elegant, very nicely, presented, but the problem here is that is solving this optimization problem is NP-complete, and uh, as all optimization guys will do, they start relaxing this method, and then you are relaxing, then you are, when you do relaxation, you uh, deal with many, many other issues, and uh, so, in fact, the, the two main issues is the tightness challenge, which is, in fact, when you relax, in fact, you find a very loose bound. So the bound is very close to the actual Y0 that I mentioned, which is not valuable that much. And also scalability, so it works for very small neural network and not the large. So I'm not going to talk about this. In fact, my PhD student, Mohammed, is working on this. He's pulling his hair every day to, to find a tighter bound. And his poster is here, so you can chat with him if you are interested. But uh, but what are the, is there are there any other defense mechanism? But they are still general, and they can be considered somehow not example specific. I don't know how much time. Six minutes. Okay, so I'll try to be better, perhaps a bit quick. So the idea is, in fact, again, uh, uh, stemmed from the stem from the. Uh, from Nicholas' paper, Nicholas and Nicholas, I think, uh, a 2016 paper, they, in fact, suggested the defensive distillation method for defending against this type of adversarial example, which was not by any means trained by those examples, but was protecting the model uh, and, and trying to prevent attacks to find the gradient 
if you, if you remember, I showed you an optimization problem to be solved in order to find those examples. So they wanted to hide those gradients such that, in fact, those examples cannot be found. We, but, but the bad news was that, in fact, in less than a year, in fact, Carlini and Wagner found a way to, to circumvent what they had tried to hide. Uh, sorry, I'm not getting to the details of the technical part. I think the, the story is like this. So, so and then the, and we started, in fact, with other, um, again, papers that still Nicholas were involved, trying to come up with an idea of how we can defend against those uh, attacks. So uh, we basically, we started the defensive distillation, which the success of the defensive, defensive distillation was based on using temperature and trying to uh, soften the, the gradient of the model, which two models there, teacher and student, uh, so I'm not getting to the detail of that, but we, the, the main issue there was that uh, they used the softmax layer in, because they, they softened the gradient on the very last layer, which was the softmax. Carlini and Wagner, in order to circumvent that, they used one layer before that, which is the logic layer. So they started looking at logic layer and recovered those gradients from the logic. So they were almost totally collapse the, the defense mechanism. We said, okay, the idea was super simple. Try to scramble logic. Can we do that? Of course, we add noise, so no one can use it. If you have input and try to add noise to that layer, perhaps you will be able to scramble it. And the next Carly one there may say, okay, I will go one layer before, one layer before. So we have to go all the way back to add noise to the input. And uh, of course, this looks very easy and also looks uh, convincing, but there's a major problem here. You will lose accuracy a lot because you are adding noise to your input. You, and this noise is different from the noise that the perturbation that we said is a completely random noise. Uh, in, the, in our case, it's Laplacian noise. And also, what if, uh, based on you know, those who are working on security care cup principle, someone will get actually to the model, to the white box attack. So because an assumption is that the, the attacker cannot have access to those logic. And when we add noise, only the noisy logic will be available. But that's not a good assumption. So we have to use ensemble for that and then a ranking mechanism to, in fact, compensate two things. One, to avoid that uh, white box attack and also to improve accuracy. And uh, yeah, so the, our threat model was based on two ideas of uh, first to check transferability, because that's another issue. If we have an ensemble, and if attack on one of them was successful, if that attack is transferable, then again, it kills the whole method. And superimposition, if you uh, attack two of them and then combine them and attack the third network, what would happen in that case? I'm not going through the results. I'm sure you know that I will only share with you the good results, so there's no point to share with you on this. We were successful at the end. And, uh, but the one thing that I want to share with you as the, almost the very last slide is, in fact, can we certify what we did? So we don't have that uh, pre uh, previous method that, that we cannot solve that optimization problem. Fortunately, very, uh, in fact, um, smart guy, Cohen and the group, they came up with the uh, Neiman Pearson approach for probabilistic certification, and which is, uh, again, um, so the, the theorem and uh, the, the uh, formalism is here, but the idea is very simple, that from what we had in the exact optimization uh, problem and finding that margin, this time, we just want to simply find the margin based on those confidence interval of runner-up class and the, 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 the actual class and the runner-up class, and then making sure that our result always falls uh, or, or we have room from the lower confidence of the lowest possible confidence of the actual class with the upper confidence of the runner-up class. So the, the second distance that I showed there. And uh, 
there are lots of other challenges because we have an ensemble of many networks and then which one we can, we are using a voting system, so there will be a combination of many of, many of them. So how can we, in fact, find the at star probability that it's star? That's not easy. So we have to use Monte Carlo simulation for that. And of course, would be, whatever we, we say would be statistically significant. Yeah. Uh, so that was the whole thing to that about the, the, the uh, the things that we are doing uh, with my students and uh, myself, but the, I just did a kind of last night, a, a quick search about the state of number of paper published around the, about that virtual examples and how much of them are talking about the certified robustness. And surprisingly, it's very, even less than I think uh, 5%, less than 3% between the actual number of paper published on adversarial training in general, as an example, versus those who are even mentioning the robustness uh, certification. And from the practical perspective is also there are, I would suggest this paper from Satmel, you look into that, this paper is an interesting paper. They looked at the actual, the challenges of machine, uh, adversarial machine learning in, in the industry. Many people, they then don't know, and they are those who are in fact, embedding those machine learning algorithms to many of the current products. And so many of them are not even aware of it, and some they just heard here and there. So there's a huge gap between industry and the real uh, research. So from the research perspective, three main challenges that uh, we are dealing with right now is the deterministic versus probabilistic uh, methods, the scalability challenges that are even the the, the, the easiest, or I would say the, the method that is mostly a very common method and in fact the bound that generates is loose, uh, which is branch and bound, in fact only can solve problems with the 10 to the 5 neurons, which is a moderate C part 10 type of problem. So we don't have that. And also the tightness challenges, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, the work that we, I presented is, present, is, is in these two papers, if you are, and the codes are available if you want to look into. And uh, it's mostly based on this, uh, the, the two of my students that are now graduated and the other students that are working with me. Yeah, yeah. with that note, I stop here, and if there's any question, I'll be at the end. Yeah, a question or two? I'm just wondering if you have looked into the connection between robustness and privacy if you're um, involving some ensemble voting. It might be interesting to... Yeah. Uh, very interesting question, thanks, Nicholas. In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the methods, Pixel B, I think, that you called it, in fact, they... So we added the random noise trying to... Uh, make the, the, the layers noisy or uh, there are, of course, there are many other methods of adding noise in training time and uh, even, even in inference time. But uh, Pixel B, I think they looked at the, instead of just a random noise, adding differentially private noise. And then exactly measure the, the margin that I just showed you here, that uh, probabilistic margin. Because there, again, we are dealing with randomness. And that's also another I'm aware of, but we haven't compared our work with them. So, but the, the, the thing is that uh, as I went through the paper, they were very reluctant to, 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 uh, to claim that you can achieve both at the same time. They said, even if the noise is coming from the visual privacy, we can just guarantee the process, but not the, uh, the privacy property. There's one question in the chat, which uh, I saw part of it. Uh, can somebody, I, I don't know how to see the full, uh, question. Uh, Reza, you might be able to see the tablet in front of you. Oh, here? Okay. I think there is a man that uh, There's a view and then participants. There's more. I was supposed to have more. Chat, yeah. Okay. So I have a naive question. Coming from industry, if we only focus on one algorithm and a specific data set, is the computation cost 
for deterministic certification, still NP. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure. I, have to, I think we have to have more information. But the, the, the certified robustness, generally speaking, is exponentially very uh, complex. So that's the reality. But uh, I know for for some of the models that are being built for aviation industry, which is that very small number of neurons. In fact, you can get uh, uh, you can get you can solve even even exponential. It means uh, you have enough computation. If you have enough computational power, you can get. So it all depends on the size and the the, the problem in hand. Cool. Any other questions by others? Plus, maybe one last question. So yeah, like you mentioned, the Pixel DP paper by Lacuya et al. And I guess that sort of evolved into this randomized smoothing. Uh, Result of Cohen et al. And um, your your thing also is based on randomized smoothing, right? It fits into uh, so we are in fact. So I didn't have time to go through the details of that that model. We are using temperatures for for randomized smoothing, but yeah. uh, but we adding noise in order to scramble the logic layer, not to be a cutoff. Yeah, we are. Oh, got it. Um, was there one more question in the chat? I thought I saw something I could have been imagining. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> cool. All right, um, yeah, with that uh, example, yeah, let's thank uh, Reza again.